Welcome, fellow plebs. My name is Sean, and this is Tribunus Plebis. And welcome back, everybody. And so here we are again talking about what these recent union wins mean for American labor moving forward. Now, I do know that the subject of the Teamsters UPS strike and the UAW strike are a bit dated at this point, at least when it comes to the direct results and wins of those strikes. And originally, I was going to open this episode going over the contract wins for the UAW and the Teamsters, the specifics of these new contracts and so on. But given the length of time that has elapsed, I've decided to get right into the you know, kind of the forward-looking part of this issue for this episode. So thank you for joining me in a brief discussion about the UAW and the Teamsters victories, not to mention the many smaller unions like the Las Vegas Hotel Workers, various nurses' unions across the country and so forth, as well as the organizing of places like Starbucks and Amazon. And, uh... I guess just just discussing what they could mean for the working class at large as we move forward into this new year. So first, I do want to talk very briefly about both the UAW stand-up strike here, just a minute or so, uh, because I think it was important. And then I want to talk about how the United Auto Workers have launched the largest organizing push in their history, or at least the biggest since their very earliest days. So when this recent strike started, I was not entirely sure how the stand-up strike method would work. It was new, or I guess I should say, or even if it would work. It was new. And while we could understand the concept, we just didn't necessarily know exactly how it would be run. It was also targeting three companies at once, which hadn't been done before. It was even being uh, run by a still very new leadership at the UAW, headed up by Sean Fain. And Fain was a guy that we knew for sure could talk the talk, but could he and would he walk the walk as well? The stand-up concept had obvious advantages. It allowed the union to strike for an extended period of time without draining their strike funds. This is huge. If everybody goes on strike at once then those strike funds are just getting gobbled up quick every day, getting drained every week. This would put huge pressure on the union, for even from uh, you know very pro-strike workers, to end the strike as soon as possible, or quicker than maybe they would want. It also allowed strategic strikes by targeting specific plants. For example, the union opened the action by striking one specific building, from each automaker. And when Ford negotiations made progress and the other two did not, those other two would see the strike expand to other buildings while Ford was quote-unquote rewarded with no expansion of labor actions. Or if an automaker was being particularly difficult, the union could strike at one or more of that company's most important or most profitable locations to ramp up the pressure. One way that we saw how this strategic aspect came into play was when Fane was negotiating with Ford at their headquarters. They eventually hit an impasse. Ford backed away from the table and left the room, leaving Fane and his team behind. Fane simply took out his phone, called a number, and told the largest factory in the Ford umbrella, the Kentucky truck plant, to walk out. The strike had expanded. And Fane was on the front steps of the Ford headquarters, that's not a good look if you're Ford, speaking to the media before Ford even knew that there was a new strike happening. This very simple, very basic act was the impetus to Ford caving on several issues and getting this first tentative agreement signed and sealed. Once Ford caved, the other two automakers followed in quick succession and the UAW had a major, if imperfect, win under their belts. Okay, so the stand-up strike method worked. But what does all of this mean as we move forward? How can the stand-up strike, the victory of the UAW here, Starbucks organizing, Amazon organizing, and numerous other labor wins all across the country, and the continued revitalization and the rising morale and militancy um, of labor both in the auto industry and more broadly all across the country? Oh, and let's not forget here that the new UPS contract and their near strike either. 
even without a strike, that new contract was just another link in the growing chain of successful organizing moving across the country. And, uh, I mean, you know what? Before we go on, let's talk about Fane and O'Brien here again very briefly. Just very briefly. We've done it before, but I think it bears a little repeating. They both came to power after many years of internal union strife. Both the Teamsters and the UAW had become company unions. They served capital. They were too glad-handy and too cooperative uh, you know, with the company power structures. In short, they did the company's bidding in direct contradiction of the needs of those whom they were supposed to serve, the workers, the members of their union. Both unions worked from within to democratize their systems, and those forces were victorious and led to the elections of these two men along with their cabinets. In fact, the election of Fane happened at the beginning of the year and is sort of like the opening salvo fired in one of the most impressive and important years in American labor in quite some time. Now, are they both flawless? No. I have more criticisms of O'Brien than Fane, but let's, I guess, move that to a potential future episode and say that even O'Brien is a far cry better than Hoffa Jr. and leave it there. Plus, the Teamsters Union itself, while still flawed, is far closer to the democratic ideal that it should be, right? I mean, unions should be democratic for the members. It's closer to that than it was two years ago, as is the UAW. The Teamsters' win was a significant reversal of the business-friendly Hoffa Jr. regime, and the UAW contract was a full reversal of 50 years of capitulation to capital. Both wins have been inspiring to workers across the country. And so I guess I have to ask again, what all of this, uh, you know, the more democratic unions, the better leadership, and the more militant members, what does it all mean looking into the future? Well, I think the first thing it does show is that union companies truly do set the curve. One of the constant things I hear argued against me is that if union workers get raises, then the non-union car companies will just undercut them even more on prices and dominate the market. They'll pay their workers less, sell their cars cheaper, and dominate. So, good luck with your raises and benefits, you losers, because Toyota and Honda and Hyundai and everybody else, they will wreck your companies by underpaying people and selling things cheaper. Now, first off, just on the surface, this is all born of a culture of fear, which has been purposefully created, created, I said I want to be very clear about that. It was created by the unionized companies, by the companies, and all of those neoliberal shipbirds who hate workers. It was created to prevent their workers from demanding dignity, safe work conditions, fair raises, and good wages. But the stats, they don't bear this out. It is a lie. In fact, a study by DiNardo and Lee shows that unions have no discernible effect on the survivability of firms from year 1 to year 18 after being organized. In this case, 18 years was the limit to the data that they used to make their assessment. So, you know, I mean, the first 18 years, that's a lot of data. There's no discernible effect from unionizing. And, you know, after seeing all of this, I am once again left to wonder, if all the people who blame unions for the failures of every unionized company, which I guess goes out of business or fails in some way, do they blame not having a union for the failures of every non-union company? They definitely don't. You know, that, that was not a genuine question. They do not do that. What they do blame is bad decision making from the ownership. And that's the same for union companies. Unions All that they do is negotiate for their workers, better wages, benefits, work conditions. But all those other decisions, it's the leadership from the company, right? Union, non-union, that's why companies fail. Now, as to wages, particularly in the auto industry, well, guess what happened immediately after the Ford uh, TA and its contents were uh, announced? 
Guess what happened? Take a wild guess. Most of you probably know. Well, non-union Toyota announced that there would be a wage hike of over 9% for its workers in the United States. Non-union Honda then announced 11% wage hikes. Then non-union Hyundai said that its Alabama and Georgia workforce would receive a 25% wage increase over the next four years. Union contracts, it turns out, set floors. They do not sink companies. They raise all boats. And speaking as somebody who works in a traditionally union-dominated field, LTL Trucking, I can say from first-hand experience that the lack of union representation is actually directly hurting the rest of us as far as wages and benefits go. I can't even imagine the harm that Zollers has done to the entire sector with his intentional dismantling of Yellow Freight. And I say that it hurts the rest of us as far as wages go, because I was just having a conversation today with a coworker, and we're expected to get a 4% raise this year. Just 4%. And he was all waving the company flag, like, hooray, hurrah. Like, we should get 10%. That's where it should be starting. And, you know, these guys are, oh, no, I'm not even going to complain. I'm not going to ask for more. Just take what they give you, I guess. I don't know. I really don't understand. Uh, Union contracts, they help raise the floor across entire sectors. And because of that, it really raises them across entire industries as well. Without them, the rest of us are left to our own version of hopes and dreams, hoping the billionaire is nice enough to allow us a few cents more per hour. 4%. Ah! And, and, you know, like dreaming about one day being financially secure, but they never let us be. Uh, Another aspect here that I think we should talk about was how public the UAW was in their bargaining, and I guess how public the Teamsters were not. This was a big criticism of O'Brien and the Teamsters. The UAW put out their asks in a very public way. It started with demands of a 40% wage increase. 4%! Oh yeah, woo, they gave it to us. And four-day work weeks. These were big asks, obviously. Um, They also had other things like COLA, cost of living adjustments, and bringing back true pensions. They were ridiculed by many for this. Some people thought 40 plus percent raises were pure idiocy, that these workers would be lucky to get 10%, and that they really only deserved and would likely only get 5 or 6%. 4%, yeah, woo. Uh, And you know what? They ended up, they got... 25% raises. The company said that they would never go over 7%. Ford said that. They got 25%, guys. They got 25. And we're cheering for four. Uh, So this... Sorry, I got... That 4% really bugs me. But we got this very transparent and public bargaining. And it did a few things, and we can see how it contrasted with the Teamsters bargaining with UPS, which was ridiculed by many UPS workers as being far too opaque. The Teamsters negotiated, got what is pretty widely considered a very good contract, but when it was presented, members were annoyed that they weren't kept abreast of what was going on to voice their concerns, or, you know, the things that they wanted. The UAW was essentially the complete opposite of this. They routinely showed their hand, explained what was being offered, what they were demanding, where the disagreements were, and, you know, so on. The rank and file had opportunities to see what was happening, to voice their concerns, and to at least attempt to influence the bargaining committee. This is how these things should be run, by the way, democratically, with the voice of the people heard. Um, Another huge issue with the UAW contract is its length and end date. It will end April 30th. This is uh, six months longer than most UAW contracts. And the next labor action that will be taken will begin on May 1st, which is International Workers' Day, the real Labor Day. We did an episode on this. It's in the playlist. Check it out. This move or this date 
is both symbolic and a call to arms. Fein is asking as many unions as possible to end their contracts on or as close to May 1st, 2028 as possible so that their lies in you know actual reach of the unions and actual reach of the workers, what amounts to the holy grail of labor, a general strike. This move would remove the fact that sympathy strikes are illegal in the United States. Workers from UPS can't strike as a way to help auto workers as a you know simple but crude example. Or vice versa, UAW can't strike to support UPS strikers. But if their contracts end at the same time, they can all strike legally, together as a unified front. Now, I'm not saying that all strikes have to be legal. They don't. But this certainly does make it a lot easier on the workers, the people who would actually have to strike to do so. Just imagine for a second, if you will, the auto workers, 150,000 of them, all the UPS drivers, delivery personnel, and DHL workers, let's throw them in there too, who are also Teamsters, by the way, um, healthcare workers across the country, the Vegas hotel workers, uh, steel workers in you know, the steel belt, the iron belt, all walking off the job on the same day. And let's think about how much power the workers would hold in their hands at that moment. It's actually just pretty wild to even consider it. Then consider throwing uh, you know, Amazon warehouse workers and delivery drivers on top of that. How much how much power, how much leverage would workers hold in their hands? And now I'm not saying that Fane and the UAW did everything perfectly here either, or that this contract is perfect, or that it addressed everything that you know, to everybody's fullest desires. It didn't. Let's be honest. Let's just throw it all out there. There are legit uh, criticisms of the contract. But at the very least, the workers who make up the union knew what was going on. Even if it was broad strokes and, you know, then they were able to talk about what was happening and be heard. We know that the stand-up strike was a successful way to bargain because Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors, wrote the following in a statement. Just as the union was beating her ass from one end of the conference table to the other and crushing her company one plant at a time all across the country. She wrote, quote, Serious bargaining happens at the table, not in public. End quote. That, my friends, was, is, and always will be the hilarious death rattle of a hopeless CEO who got too used to dealing with a corrupt, corporate-friendly, conciliatory United Auto Workers, a paradigm which was thrown into a vat of strong acid as soon as Fane and the rest of the, I guess, I guess the reformers, I guess, you know, not just Fane. I don't want to just make this all about Sean Fane, but the rest of the reformers were elected into positions of power, right? It was Fain and his cabinet and local leadership as well. Now imagine multiple industries doing this all at once. It would actually open a new front in the war between capital and labor, and the labor would actually be able to press the attack rather than fall right back into its strategic retreat mode of the last five decades. This new UAW is, as all unions should be, antagonistic to the corporation. It recognizes that the battle isn't about glad-handing rich dorks in corporate suites, but rather it's about organizing frontline workers and strong-arming everything you can from the wealthy capitalist wage-stealing losers at the helm and directing it back to the workers where it always belonged and where it always originates. The success of the Teamsters and the UAW along with Uh, The Hollywood SAG after strikes, I forgot to mention them earlier. Um, Others as well. It has shown that labor can win. It showed that more democratic, more militant, and more ambitious unions can win. Public approval of unions is at an all-time high, and many auto workers at non-union companies are openly campaigning for union membership. This is another forward-looking issue here. Literally as soon as the auto company TAs were all announced, Fane began talking about organizing the non-union companies across the country, Toyota, Ford, Hyundai, Subaru, and so on. 
or sorry, not Ford. I think I just said Ford there. Uh, Toyota, Hyundai, Subaru, Volkswagen. I think there's another one. Mercedes. And we will cover this uh, organizing stuff, I guess, as we move forward into the new year. But a few things are worth mentioning right now. There is already an exploratory committee working on organizing Tesla plants, and organizers have been around the other companies for years. Tesla, of course, is run by anti-union dingbat Elon Musk, who has already been sued and found to have violated workers' rights in his factories. Just, uh, I guess maybe two weeks ago now, Musk was warning his assembly plant workers that they should prepare to sleep at their posts to keep up with production demands. That would not fly in a union company, and that should not fly at any company. People should have time at home. Anything else is madness. People need lives. And setting aside how deeply sick and twisted the very notion that speaking those words isn't pure evil, dictates like that, they, you know, they just might be the toehold that union organizers need to push through the structural barriers in their way. We can even see how unions can affect auto companies uh, like Tesla by what's happening over in Sweden, where various unions have been striking against Tesla for over two months now, I believe, and continue to as of this recording um, of this episode. They have refused to load or unload cars. And postal workers have even refused to deliver Tesla mail-in packages. Uh, Sympathy strikes are allowed in Sweden. These actions are extremely effective, but they are illegal here. Hyundai workers in Alabama have signed over 30% of their workers to union cards, which is a huge milestone towards unionization, and they have done so in a very open way, rather than sort of sneaking around behind the bosses' backs, uh, you know, for as long as possible. They basically announced a campaign when they had just 10% of workers signed to cards and have run from there. Now, winning is obviously great for organizing, and they have been winning. But so is being democratic and open, which they have been as well. Volkswagen workers have hit 50% of workers signed to cards, signaling a very real upcoming vote and a very optimistic outlook on that potential vote. This is the same plant that has lost... I believe that they've lost twice in the past five years or so. And the second one, they barely lost. It was a nail biter. But this one, it looks like they will probably win. Down in Huntsville, Alabama, Toyota workers are already enthusiastically talking about the union just based off of the union wins, which, you know, it has obviously achieved, um, but also the public rhetoric in the open book bargaining. Things like this are catnip to workers who understand that they are being taken advantage of right they see wins they see the rhetoric and they see that they're being honest about it what else do you need seeing such transparent talk from the union and the workers themselves it helps highlight how the union can help with problems that might seem insurmountable to non-union workers The workers at the Huntsville plant, they struggle under speed-up work where they need to work at unsafe speeds, and they need to do it under mandatory overtime. Well, the union openly talked about eliminating forced overtime. They talked about safety and reasonable production levels, and their contract actually addresses these things. This is one of the big advantages of a contract. There are rules that can be pointed to in which the union can force companies to abide by. At a non-union plant, all you have is stuff like OSHA for safety issues, you know, just as an example. And OSHA is fine. It serves a purpose. I don't think we need to get rid of it or anything. It's good for what it does. But the purpose of OSHA is to establish safety minimums. It establishes a floor. This is really, really important to think about. OSHA provides a minimum of safety requirements. And again, that is not a bad thing in and of itself. But what a union can do is raise that safety floor and raise it very high in some cases. OSHA might say, okay, that type of metal forming machine where you make a body part, it needs two safety guards on it, 
and there has to be non-slip flooring, and the operator has to wear gloves. That's the minimum. That's what OSHA demands. That's what the company has to provide. It's a minimum. A union contract can say, hey, you know what? We've had guys working on this machine for 20 years. They understand it. They say that they need a third safety guard. They need anti-fatigue mats, not just non-slip flooring. They need gloves and they need goggles. And maybe it requires more frequent breaks or a second person for loading material and, you know, so on and so forth. And the great thing is that by being in the contract, these aren't just suggestions. They're rules which must be followed. And with a union comes more than just wages and benefits. This is something which we don't talk enough about, I think, uh, now that I've actually said that out loud. It even goes beyond that dignity issue that I mentioned earlier and that I know I've said in the past. Dignity and just work-life balance, stuff like that, seeing your family is so important. But the union can get you representation on the shop floor, someone to advocate on behalf of the workers to management and the union. The contract itself can set rules like I was just saying, and it can set procedures in places which must be followed if a rule is broken. No more, you know, being fired just because. No more of the company saying, well, this will work. This is fine with only two guards. Like, no, it's in the contract. Put the third guard on it or else I'm not working. With a contract, there is now a series of steps which must be taken, uh, you know, before you get fired or before the company can force you to do something and you have a representative from the union to support you. It can also create a grievance process so that when an employer breaks the law or the union contract, the employees now have a defined route that they can take to make it stop, possibly be financially compensated even, and in many cases to make sure it never happens again. These are all victories to be had. And now normally right now, you'd be hearing an ad for our Buy Me A Coffee page where you could donate and sign up for memberships. Now, after a long internal battle, I have decided to close that page down. If you were a member, your membership will have been canceled long ago, though you will remain on a free one for as long as I keep using Buy Me A Coffee. It will just be a way to alert you of new episodes and such. You know, I guess sort of a newsletter or whatever. But it will all be free. Uh, essentially, the stress of having people send me money every month was overwhelming me with anxiety. I didn't like it. It kept me from doing things. It kept me from doing things well. And so to all those who joined as members or donated, I cannot possibly thank you enough. I opened the page with modest expectations. I assume just a couple of close friends and family might, you know, put some money in it. Uh, I was absolutely floored when people began signing up. It was the most amazing feeling that so many would find this podcast so useful that they would financially support it so readily. So I'll just say thank you all again. And now for the very last time for quite a while, I imagine, I end this not commercial segment with, and now back to the episode. So while victories are certainly awesome in and of themselves, when it comes to workers battling against these, you know, giant corporation, these corporate behemoths, even, I guess, I guess even earning a draw is a pretty big deal, right? Just simply not losing ground is often considered an outright victory by many observers. And sometimes there is some validity to this. I mean, it's hard out there for workers. Uh, but we have become, as the working class, as the proletariat, far too accustomed to simply surviving, barely scraping by. Sometimes, you know, to the point of even dismissing clear wins as losses. And I just want to address this here very briefly, uh, just some criticisms that I had heard. I guess as an example... I was recently watching some YouTube and TikTok clips concerning both of these strikes. They were a, a little bit older, to be fair to the people who recorded these. You know, I was kind of going back in time and just listening to things from my feed, I guess. And I saw a few workers in both of these unions, UAW and the Teamsters. Uh, but more prominently, it was just sort of 
commentators who sort of talk about the same sorts of things that we do here at Tribunus Plebis Media. And these folks talked about how both the Teamsters non-strike, right, because they didn't actually go on strike, and the UAW strike were somehow both selling out the working class. So I, I just want to say that, you know, you can't have it both ways, really, either. You know, you don't strike, you're a sellout, you strike, but not in the right way, you're a sellout. It's kind of getting silly, I think. And I so I do have to say that I disagree with this statement, especially in a broad sense. Some points, when taken alone, do, I think, have at least some merit, right? But in the reality of the world we live in, I just think most of this sentiment, like 98% of it maybe, is just flat out wrong. The arguments to just pick a few here were things like the Teamsters didn't strike, so they sold everyone out. I even saw one UPS worker say that he was a no vote on the contract, but that he liked the contract and that he recognized that it was a record contract and that he would have voted yes if they had struck for a week or two. He said that, um, I'm trying, I, I didn't write a quote down here, unfortunately, but he basically said something along the lines of, I'm going to vote no on this contract. And if the no's win and we go on strike for a week, even if we don't gain anything, I'll vote yes, because it's a good contract. He just wanted to strike. And I just don't really understand this line of thought. The person likes the contract enough to vote yes on it, but just wants to strike to say that they struck. To show the company, I guess, that they would strike and that they were willing to. I guess that's the best framing of it. But for what? Just to tell your friends? You got a contract you like, your union won what you wanted. You aren't even trying to get something more with this strike, so why strike? He didn't want anything other than to strike. It just, I was about to say it strikes me as, but it just kind of hits me as, you know, sort of a labor adventurism, if I'm using that term correctly. I think I am, but whatever. You, I think you get my point. I guess I just view this all as you should strike for a reason. You strike to gain something. You strike for a cause. I've said this a bunch of times on here, on this episode, or not this episode, but on this podcast, that strikes are hard, especially for the employees who make less to start with. If you tell me you want to strike to, you know, get a higher starting wage or to improve wages for part-timers or to get part-timers sick days or something, hell yeah, go for it. But don't do it just to brag about how hardcore you are. It's a publicity stunt at that point with no real purpose. UPS will be content to just watch your coworkers continue to struggle and use it as a talking point against you and your union on the next contractual go around. The head of UPS and its PR department, they will absolutely sit down and tell workers all across the country to never forget when the union struck for two weeks and didn't even ask for anything new. They will not hesitate to remind workers that they were deprived of good pay for two weeks just so that their members could look tough on their Instagram and TikTok feeds. And that message will carry weight. The idea of the union, the core principle in my opinion, the primary reason to organize, is power. It's not about optics, or even to give a little bit um, you know, of more credit here to the argument I'm speaking against, it's not about just doing it to show that you can. The Teamsters, the UAW, they're not Marxist organizations. You can't expect them to act that way. They're not even leftist organizations. Half of the Teamsters and half of the UAW, they're conservative. A good chunk of those people are Trumpers. On the other side, most of them are just kind of conservative Democrats like Biden. There's a small amount of actual leftists and a very small amount of like principled ideological leftists. I don't know what to call them. I'm not sure where they line up on the, you know, the lefty scale, but, you know, Maoists aren't in power in the Teamsters. Unions should be, I don't know if should be is the right way to say it, but it it is organizing is all about power. It's about the strength in numbers that banding together provides. And it, it's about harnessing that strength properly 
and towards a specific target. If that strength is enough to get you what you want, what you need, what you're willing to accept, then that's cool. It's okay to not strike. You aren't selling out by getting a good contract that you're happy with. You've won. You actually won. Maybe you should have asked for more. I don't know. Maybe it's not a perfect contract. But if you're willing to vote yes on it, you won, brother. Yeah, a union should absolutely be willing to strike when necessary. It should be willing and ready to. It should be able to. Being willing, able, and motivated to strike and to lay it all on the line is definitely of the utmost importance. And the strike itself is the ultimate application of that strength when it's being leveraged towards a goal. A strike without a goal, a strike just to strike, is, as far as I'm concerned, near empty optics. And this is even more pertinent, I guess, since the people who want this, like I was just saying before, they're just like a, such a small minority of these unions. They demand a pointless strike to shore up their own selfish political and social media reasons, all at the expense of their fellow workers. Yeah, it is at the expense of them if they're convincing them to go on strike for no reason. They want to look cool, or maybe to frame this as best as I can again, they want to express their own version of a class struggle, a version I believe to be quite lacking. A union shouldn't be about empty optics, spending a few days on a picket line for no reason. And, and remember, like these arguments are not mine. They're not my words. This is what they were just saying that they wanted to do. They wanted to strike for no reason. Striking for no reason but the flex and pose isn't praxis. It certainly isn't power either. A pointless strike might earn some accolades from, you know, random Twitter accounts, but it won't result in 22% raises. It won't result in bringing back thousands of jobs to union workers or improve tens of thousands of lives. Striking for no reason at all will not reopen entire auto plants in cities that were destroyed when they closed down and left. Now, other commentators claim that Sean Fain, head of the UAW, sold out his membership with this stand-up strike. They argued that by not declaring a strike everywhere all at once, that they took too weak a stance and therefore were acting as, you know, a company-focused union and capitulating from the start. They ignored all of the benefits of this new type of strike. The tactical advantages that could be gained by striking at particular plants one at a time at any time that they chose, a method which they would actually end up using to ratchet the pressure up one walkout at a time, while also stretching out how far the strike fund would last before being depleted. And this last goal was important not just for this strike, but for the next contract as well. Now, there is, I hope, obviously, no way to truly know which method could work the best. It's just not possible to A-B test something like this. At least not, I guess, not live. Maybe we can look into the future, you know, see how other strikes do. But that's not easy to accomplish, right? But we can see what the stand-up method got these auto workers in their contracts, right? And we can compare it to how few workers had to suffer through a strike to get it. And I think that that part is worth thinking about. Another thing to note here, um, I guess I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'll touch on it a little bit more, is that basically all of these criticisms, um, all of the issues like this that I heard or read came from the far left of the political aisle. Now, I, I consider myself kind of far left. Um, maybe I'm not as far left as he, actually, I know I'm not. <laughs> I know a couple of these accounts and I'm not as far left as them, I don't think. They typically, uh, you know, at least claim to be Marxist or MLs or MLMs or, you know, as their basis to these claims. But here's the thing. Like I said, the Teamsters, the UAW, they aren't an ML organization. They just aren't. Calling for a strike because you feel like it's a Marxist thing to do or a Maoist thing to do or a Leninist or what any of the other slivers on the far left. Um, 
I think it just speaks to a very small portion of the union, as far as I can tell, at least. You know, uh, it, they're all conservatives or Trumpers or Ayn Rand libertarians and, you know, right of center Democrats, um, DSA types. That's that's the vast majority of these uh, unions. And I'm all for pushing good ideas to help the working class. I hope, you know, if you're listening to this, I hope you agree with that. I hope you understand that. But trying to treat the Teamsters like some sort of hardcore local, you know, Marxist-Leninist organization just isn't going to work. They aren't that. Just clearly, they aren't that. And I also reject that these criticisms have any real salience at all beyond the smallest levels. And again, I think that some of these criticisms, like point by point, have some real worth to discuss, but not in the way that they're being discussed. And if people, I guess, disagree, if they think that's a foolish way to look at it, please reach out in the comments or the email. Um, I will gladly listen. I'll read whatever you write and we can have a dialogue about it or I can address it in a future episode if people respond. But hey, I mean, that's just how I feel. Uh, you know, hey, I'm willing to be corrected. And the point of all of that, and I went a little bit longer on that point than I really intended to. I hope I didn't lose anybody. But the point of all of that was just to point out that we need to win. Not just do things to be the most left person or the most union person that, you know, that we can be and impress Twitter or the other hardcore people that think like us. And when we win, we need to actually celebrate those wins together and not just turn around and just disembowel each other at the after party. We need to actually support each other through these struggles. Criticism is fine, but we, you know, when, when we have a victory, just be happy for a day. Hug your brothers, hug your comrades, whatever. Say, nice job. And then work towards a better outcome next time. The UAW, you know, launches an innovative new strike that they call the stand-up strike. An homage to the famous sit-down strikes that built that union from the ground up. And the first response is from at least some people, even if it's a small minority, they are class traders. And this is just, it just hits me as some weird, ultra nonsense in my opinion. And it certainly is not, in my opinion, at least class struggle. And it definitely is not solidarity. Now, I talked a lot in this episode about the United Auto Workers for good and obvious reasons, I think. They took it to the big three and got a great record-setting contract. But I do want to once again talk about the reform of the UAW that led to this outcome. And it's something, like everything I talk about in this section, this little, uh, probably just a couple of minutes. But everything I talk about here, this is something that's forward-looking. Other unions need to do this. New unions need to be built this way. The Unite All Workers for Democracy Caucus, the UAWD, made this happen. They forced it to happen from the ground up within the union. It didn't happen overnight. It took many years to accomplish its goal. This is not some overnight thing that just happens. It's not a snap of the fingers. It took courage, planning, and commitment to change their union from within. And without this minority caucus, without the right to democratically uh, directly elect their leaders, the UAW would have gotten another terrible company-friendly contract with more concessions than paltry wins. We must not forget about this part of the story both for the UAW and for all those who were and will be inspired by what they accomplished. We can include the Teamsters for a Democratic Union Caucus in here as well, by the way. They changed their union from within as well and elected O'Brien, and they got themselves their own record contract and avoided another company-friendly disaster. But we must also recognize that not every strike this year was a win. There were losses as well. The United Mine Workers returned to work at Warrior Met without a new contract, something we covered here in a previous episode. It was a tragic end to a protracted battle. 
And I bring that up to note that even that strike was inspiring to the movement as a whole. It was inspiring to see those workers go through so much to fight for and with each other, to sacrifice so much for each other. Yes, it did end in a loss, but it also highlighted how the state will truly tip the scales for the companies at a moment's notice. Alabama even used state police to escort scabs to the work plants to protect them and get them past picket lines. Yes, it helped destroy the strike, but it also helped shine the light onto the process, which is so heavily slanted towards capital, and that in and of itself, the shining of that light, is an important event in and of itself. It also showed that the government isn't going to save us, the workers. It screamed in our faces that we must be the ones to save ourselves. The exploitation of workers has been with us from the beginning of this country, slavery being the most obviously horrific example that there is, and it continues to this day with wage labor. The liberal side, and by the way, I'm not comparing slavery and wage labor, just to make clear. So the liberal side of the country, right, it tells us that the government will save us through procedural and legal means. Hey, if the law says that we are all equal, then that's the end of it, right? The conservative side of the country, on the other hand, it insists that we must save ourselves and only ourselves and let all others sink or swim on their own. Individual strength is all that matters, all that exists, really. Both of these notions, setting aside all the political machinations that reinforce them here in the United States, they are alluring to many people. To simply pass a law on one side and to simply be selfish on the other side. So simple, right? It's so simple that both of these um, ideas are fascinating to many people. Unfortunately, many people never dig below the surface and really examine the outcomes of these bizarre ideas which seduce them so easily. True power is working together with other people, for other people, for a common cause. It's collectively challenging the powerful and forcing change upon them. All of this, the accumulation of wins, the organizing of the previously unorganized, the formation of new unions, the strengthening of existing unions, the fall of others, the failures of other strikes, it all, when we combine them together in aggregate, creates an inspired moment which inspired a movement. A while back, I said that a lot of the anti-union sentiment is born of an indoctrinated culture of fear. A culture which is carefully crafted, carefully maintained, and carefully cultivated by the powers that be. And these powers include political, judicial, uh, Wall Street power, and direct capital owners as well, uh, if we want to get a little bit more narrow. But these wins and even the losses, are beginning to crack through that fear. It's beginning to show us that victories are there for the taking. It's beginning to inspire. It's beginning to show us that we don't need to be exploited, at least not as much anyway. We suffer and we fear, but for what? The reality is that we can suffer and be underpaid, and undervalued somewhere else. Why not work with your buddies and fight for what you deserve? I'm not saying that it's always that easy. I'm just saying that the scales are starting to fall from our eyes. So to tie up this portion of the episode, and I guess start to end it, I, I guess I want to say that a good contract is not the end of exploitation. In fact, it's really the continuation of it. The best contract in the world will still take too much from the worker and give too much to capital. Wage slavery is not abolished with a strike, even a very successful one. It is, at least I believe, important to recognize this and deal with it. Freedom, equality, dignity. These are the things that we need to fight for, and they are not all tied directly to wages. A 5% raise doesn't make us more free or equal or give us more dignity in any meaningful sense. I do not say this to diminish raises and benefits, by the way. I want higher pay myself. 
I want better health care. And I want decent hours as well. I think we all do, and we all deserve it. But this, in and of itself, assumes the established system must remain in existence, right? To truly win remains unthinkable to so many. What it does do, however, is show us our strength. It shows us what can be done when workers in single individual companies and single individual sectors band together to fight for their own wealth, health, and dignity. It makes us start to think that if a couple hundred thousand people working together can reform a union and can then, you know, from there challenge and defeat three massive corporations with plants all across the country, then what could more do when faced with even larger and more significant issues? The labor movement in this country was never driven by just wages and the weekend. The early labor movements were infused with ideology and will to fight not just bosses, but to fight political leaders in moral fights as well. Altogether, they fought for morality and human dignity and for freedom and liberation from the yoke of capital. Now, that's not to say that all unions were perfectly good about civil rights. They weren't. They were bad for a long time. They aren't even perfect now, to be honest. But they did work in civil rights. There were some good things done by unions on that level. Um, I don't want to make everybody saints here. Um, so I guess put, putting all that together, they fought for morality and human dignity and for freedom and liberation from the yoke of capital, even when they were imperfect in it. Or even bad. I mean, you know, unions run by white people in the 1920s weren't exactly woke, right? Uh, they recognized that the enemies were not just bosses. It wasn't employees versus bosses either. It was the working class versus capital. It was the downtrodden masses battling against those who trod. It was a rebellion against domination, a popular front against repression. It was raging against servitude and the supposed masters who demanded it. Today we see, I hope, at least, another fitful start towards class consciousness. It shows us the class war that we have long been told doesn't exist and long denied when it's been pointed out. All the while, the other side, the Elon Musks of the world, they have been actively fighting in it while many of us have even cheered them on. Whip me, beat me, Daddy Musk, please. Oh God, give it to me. Uh, when you realize that there is a war, when you realize that you have been cheering for the side that actively opposes you, the bourgeoisie, and when you realize that you are in fact part of the working class, the proletariat, it all changes. The unthinkable suddenly becomes thinkable. That's what these labor victories have begun to show us, just how thinkable, just how truly feasible these things have become. And that, my friends, is the end of the episode. And if you've made it this far, if you'll stick with me for like 30 more seconds, uh, I just want to mention two things. One, we are now proud members of the Labor Radio Podcast Network, which is a loose collective of podcasts and YouTube shows who focused at least partially, maybe mostly, on labor and working class issues. There are over 100 shows on the network, which you can check out at laborradionetwork.org. This changes nothing for you, uh, the listeners, and it changes very little for me either. There's no money exchanging hands. It's just a way to network and help each other out a little bit. The second thing is that we now have some merch. We have some logo t-shirts and sweatshirts, and you can show your support for your uh, Tribunus Plebis Media. And uh, we have a series featuring one of my favorite labor quotes of all time from Big Bill Haywood that says, I may not have read Marx's Capital, but I have the marks of capital all over my body. I love that quote. So please check out the link in the description and don't be afraid to buy a shirt or two or even ten or maybe a sticker or a sweatshirt or three. And just as a note, I feel like the shirts run just a hair small to size. I'm pretty much dead between a 1X and 2X t-shirt, depending on the brand. And the 2X is definitely more comfortable for me. So they might be just a little bit on the small side. And uh, with all of that, 
I shall leave you. Thank you all. I love you.